Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gather round. Today we're diving into the wacky world of war where reasons for fighting can be as absurd as a penguin on roller skates or a cat with a Napoleon complex. Prepare yourselves for the top five most idiotic causes of war in history. Trust me, you won't know whether to laugh or face palm. We've rounded up the top five most absurd and comical episodes in the history of warfare. As we delve into these five remarkable and utterly silly stories that turned wars into tragic comedy. Get ready to laugh, shake your head, and wonder how on earth these incidents ever escalated into full-blown conflicts. Let's jump right in. All righty then. Let's buckle up and take a wild ride through the wackiest war in history. The War of the Wooden Bucket. You know things are about to get ridiculous when the fate of nations hangs in the balance over a simple wooden vessel. I mean, who needs nuclear weapons when you have a good old bucket, am I right? Picture this. It's the 14th century, and we find ourselves in two neighboring city-states in northern Italy, Bologna, and Modena. It's like a medieval version of a rap battle. But instead of dropping sick rhymes, they're dropping buckets. Bologna is all about the Guelphs, while Medina is firmly on Team Ghibelline. Talk about a classic case of frenemies. And let me tell you, these folks take their buckets seriously. It's like they're part of an ancient bucket-worshipping cult or something. Now, these cities are separated by a mere 50 kilometers, so any minute an enemy army could come storming in and chaos would ensue. And oh boy, chaos did ensue. One brave mercenary decides to pull off the most daring heist in history, stealing a wooden bucket from a well. Move over, Ocean's Eleven. We got the bucket bandits here. I can almost hear the epic background music as this courageous thief snatches that precious pail. It's like a Hollywood blockbuster, but with less explosions and more... buckets. The tension between the cities reaches a boiling point as Bologna demands the return of their beloved bucket. Modena, however, stands firm, ready to defend their stolen treasure. It's like a medieval showdown where knights traded in their swords for, you guessed it, buckets. Can you imagine the battle cries? For the glory of the bucket. And so... The clash of civilizations begins. The streets are filled with warriors armed to the teeth with buckets. It's like a bizarre mix of a water balloon fight and a medieval melee. Splash, splash. Oops, sorry I accidentally spilled my bucket on you. No hard feelings, right? But alas, the Battle of Zappolino takes a tragic turn. Lives are lost, tears are shed, and all for what? A wooden bucket. It's like the world's most expensive and deadly souvenir shop. But wait, there's another version, slightly less embarrassing. Apparently, there were a few mercenaries involved, and that bucket wasn't empty. Nope. It was chock full of loot, plundered from the innocent citizens of Bologna. So, in any case, the offended party insisted on getting back that bucket. Because, you know, back then they didn't really care about private property rights, but stealing from the city's communal treasures? That was a big no-no. In the end... Modinha emerges victorious, proudly displaying their stolen trophy. The wooden bucket becomes a symbol of their triumph, a shining example of just how far humans can go for the sake of absurdity. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. A war fought over a wooden bucket. No fancy conquests or territorial gains, just a damn bucket. Remember this tale of the War of the Wooden Bucket as a cautionary reminder that sometimes, just sometimes, it's best to let the buckets be buckets and focus on the things that truly matter. Like, I don't know, world peace or finding a cure for the common cold. But hey, what do I know? I'm just a bucket enthusiast spreading the joy of historical hilarity. Stay tuned for more outrageous stories, where we'll uncover the craziest and most nonsensical moments in the annals of war. Until then, keep your buckets in check and your laughter flowing. Alrighty then, let's dig into another epic tale of culinary chaos with the War of the Defiled Pastries. Picture this. It's 1838. Mexico is in a state of uproar, and the French army decides to make their grand entrance. But hold your chimichangas, folks, because this conflict has a sugary twist. 
Now, we all know that stereotypes can be a bit spicy, and it turns out that the stereotypical Mexican of the 19th century had a particular aversion to all things sweet. I mean, who needs desserts when you can have a plate of fiery tacos, right? Well, uh, these Mexican officers took their anti-sweetness sentiment to the extreme when, for some reason, they decided to unleash their wrath upon a French pastry shop. Talk about a sugar-coated showdown. Fast forward to the aftermath of Mexico's independence, and a group of French citizens, including a certain pastry chef named Remontel, are seeking justice for the bakery debacle of 1828. These determined bakers want compensation for the trampled pastries, smashed furniture, and broken chocolate fountains. You know things have gotten serious when the cries for justice reach the ears of King Louis-Philippe himself. So, Here's the scoop. King Louis-Philippe first takes a break from sipping his café au lait and decides to flex his royal muscles. He demands that Mexico cough up a whopping 600,000 pesos in reparation for the pastry-related mayhem. That's like demanding a lifetime supply of churros and then some. But hey, when you're a king, you can have your pastry and eat it too. Of course, Mexico isn't exactly thrilled about shelling out such a dough, pun intended. They brush off the ultimatum like a dusting of powdered sugar and go about their business. Big mistake. King Louis-Philippe takes this as a personal insult and decides it's time to spice things up. His fleet blockades the port of Veracruz and starts bombarding the fortress of San Juan de Ulua. That's right, folks. It's a full-blown pastry war. Not to be outdone, the resourceful Mexicans declare a state of emergency and even try to seek help from Texas which was an independent republic at the time. I can just imagine them sending a desperate message. Help us, Texas. We're knee-deep in dough, and it's not the tasty kind. But alas, Texas couldn't provide the culinary reinforcements they needed, and Mexico had to face the French on their own. Realizing they couldn't match the culinary might of France, Mexico caved like a poorly baked souffle. They accepted the demands, paid their debts, and put an end to the war of the defiled pastries. Lesson learned, folks, never underestimate the power of a scorned pastry chef. And there you have it, a sweet and savory tale of a war fought over pastries. Remember, next time you're tempted to trample on a delicate eclair or disrespect a towering cake, think twice. Because when desserts are at stake, no one wants to bite off more than they can chew. Stay tuned for more deliciously bizarre stories where we'll uncover the tastiest and most absurd moments in the history of conflicts. Until then, keep your pastries pristine. Ah, the absurdity of history strikes again, and this time it's all about a pig. Prepare yourselves for the thrilling tale of the British-American conflict that nearly escalated into a full-blown war, all because of a pig trespassing on a potato field. Yes, you heard it right. War, swine, and spuds. So let's set the stage. It's June 15th, 1846, and the UK and the US have just signed the Oregon Treaty, aiming to settle the boundaries of their Pacific coastal territories. Sounds straightforward, doesn't it? Well, hold your bacon, because things are about to get confusing. Turns out, the maps they had were about as accurate as a blindfolded chef trying to whip up a souffle. Both countries claimed the San Juan Islands as their own, and to add fuel to the fire, both British and American settlers decided to make themselves at home on these disputed lands. They eyed each other suspiciously, like two rival chefs trying to outdo each other in a cook-off. Fast forward 13 years to June 15, 1859, and tensions have been simmering for far too long. On this fateful day, American farmer Lyman Cutler spots a colossal black pig ravaging his potato patch. Now, this wasn't the first time the porker had pulled off such a stunt. Lyman had tried shooing it away with kicks and even a good old-fashioned whack from a stick. But this time, he'd had enough. Lyman stormed back to his house, grabbed his trusty rifle, and took aim at the pig that dared to mess with his spuds. Talk about a ham-handed situation. Now here's where the bacon really hits the fan. It turns out the pig belonged to a local Irishman named Charles Griffin. And guess what? Both farmers happened to be citizens of different countries. 
As the local squabble escalated into a full-blown dispute, Lyman and Charles sought the help of their respective authorities. And boy, did things escalate quickly. The Americans wasted no time and landed 400 soldiers on the island. Not to be outdone, the British sent five ships carrying 2,000 troops. The governor of the British colony even ordered Rear Admiral Robert Baines to initiate military action if the Americans didn't leave the territory. Thankfully, Admiral Baines had a change of heart and decided to steer clear of a full-blown war. Phew! The soldiers from both sides spent their days taunting each other, but strictly adhered to the order of no opening fire first. It was like a bizarre game of insult dodgeball. When news of this pig-driven madness reached London and Washington, heads were scratched and panic ensued. They realized they couldn't let a war ignite over a pesky pig. So they scrambled for a resolution. Neutral arbitrators, led by Emperor Wilhelm I of Germany, were brought in to settle the swine dispute. And guess what verdict they rendered? Drum roll, please. The pig island was awarded to the United States. Hulza! And just like that, the war of the wretched pig came to an end. The nations sighed in relief, thankful that they had avoided the embarrassment of a full-scale conflict sparked by a stubborn swine. Let this be a lesson to all when it comes to pigs and potatoes. Diplomacy is the superior seasoning. Stay tuned for more fascinating and hilarious stories from the annals of history. You never know what bizarre, bacon-related tales might be lurking just around the corner. Until then, keep your pigs away from the potato fields and your sense of humor fully seasoned. Hold your leashes, folks. Picture this, the year is 1925, and at the border between Greece and Bulgaria, a mutt named Barkamus Maximus decides it's time to explore the world. Little did this adventurous canine know that his curiosity would trigger a comedy of errors, or should I say, woofs. Now let's set the scene battling it out over who would lay claim to the region of Macedonia and later Western Thrace. Greece and Bulgaria had been at odds since the early 20th century, already barking mad at each other over territorial disputes, were on the edge of their seats. This rivalry led to years of guerrilla warfare between armed groups from both sides in the early 1900s and, a few years later, open conflicts during the Second Balkan War and the First World War. It was a messy situation, to say the least. As a result of these conflicts, Greece managed to gain control of half of the vast region of Macedonia after the Balkan Wars and later Western Thrace after the First World War through the Treaty of Nuli. And just when you thought things couldn't get any crazier, in comes Barkamus wagging his tail and looking for a little adventure. Now there are two versions of how the incident unfolded. Brace yourselves for some canine chaos. Version 1 goes like this. On October 18th, one of the Greek border guards had a well-fed dog who decided to make a break for it. But, oh no. Barkamus was not content with a simple game of fetch. No, he wanted to take his antics. International. This four-legged troublemaker chose to make a beeline straight for the border. The soldier went after his furry friend, and right at the intersection of the two nations, he was shot dead by Bulgarian patrols from Patrich. When the Greek outpost officer got wind of what happened, he headed out to investigate, but he too was killed on the spot. There were reports of other clashes as well, but both sides continued to point fingers at each other, like a game of blame-fetch gone horribly wrong. Now, for version 2, on October 18th, Bulgarian soldiers allegedly crossed the Greek border, attacked the Greek outpost at Belisitsa, and killed a Greek captain and a sentry. Oh boy, things were really going to the dogs. Both sides, caught up in the madness, blamed each other like rival dogs marking their territory. It was a case of, he said, she said, with no one taking responsibility for this outrageous game of fetch gone awry. Greece demanded an official apology and a hefty compensation of two million French francs for the families of the deceased. But Bulgaria, being as stubborn as it was, failed to respond within the given 48-hour deadline. So Greek forces launched an invasion into the vicinity of Petrik. Several border villages were captured and the city itself was nearly taken by force. It was a howling mess. 
Meanwhile, the League of Nations, like a wise old poodle observing the chaos from a distance, decided it was time to step in and bring some order to the canine calamity. Negotiations were held, treaties were signed, and eventually, peace was restored. Who? <sighs> but wait, there's more. Greece, now with its tail between its legs, had to cough up a compensation of 45,000 pounds to Bulgaria for the invasion, and over 50 Bulgarian lives lost. It was like a giant chew toy of irony being thrown around. And as for the dog, well, as far as we know, it remains a mystery. Well, like a true canine Houdini, he vanished into thin air. Some say he became a legend, whispered among the barking brethren, a cautionary tale of the mayhem one pup can unleash. Remember, folks, never underestimate the power of a dog to set off a series of absurd events. In the game of international relations, sometimes it takes a wayward mutt to remind us all to wag our tails, not our fingers. Stay tuned for more tales of historical madness. Wolftastic tales await. Ah, the legendary football war, a clash that makes even the wildest penalty shootout look like a friendly game of keepy uppy. Picture this. El Salvador and Honduras squaring off, not on the football pitch, but on the battlefield. It's like they took the term friendly match a bit too literally. So, rewind back to 1969, a time when tensions between these two countries were hotter than a freshly microwaved pizza roll. They had their fair share of issues. But things got really spicy when the World Cup qualifiers for the 1970 tournament came into play. It was like adding chili sauce to a jalapeno burger, my friend. The whistle blew and the war kicked off on July 14th, 1969. Salvadoran troops charged into Honduras like a stampede of rabid football fans storming the stadium gates. The American States organization managed to call a timeout and brokered a ceasefire on July 18th. Hence the name 100-Hour War. It officially came into effect on July 20th, and the Salvadoran troops retreated like a player running away from a post-match interview. Now, here's the twist. Although it's called the Football War, the conflict had deeper roots than a penalty shootout. It all started with land reform in Honduras and immigration and demographic issues in El Salvador. You see, Honduras had this fancy land reform law in 1962 that gave back illegally occupied lands to indigenous Hondurans, which meant kicking out thousands of Salvadoran workers. Talk about our red card tackle! <laughs> Adding fuel to the fire, El Salvador had a larger population despite being smaller in size. It was like a tiny car carrying more passengers than a double-decker bus. By 1969, over 300,000 Salvadorans had set up camp in Honduras, making up a whopping 20% of the population. They were spreading like football fans doing the wave. Now, here's the comedic twist. In June 1969, the national football teams of El Salvador and Honduras faced off in a qualifying round for the 1970 World Cup. And oh boy, did that rivalry ignite like a streaker running across the field. During the first match in the capital of Honduras on June 8, 1969, a brawl erupted among the fans. Honduras managed to win the game 1-0, leaving Salvadorans grumbling like a coach whose halftime speech went unheard. But the real chaos came during the second match on June 15, 1969, in the Salvadoran capital. El Salvador crushed Honduras 3-0 and the victory celebrations turned into a chaotic showdown. Then, on June 27, 1969, in Mexico City, a playoff match took place. El Salvador triumphed with a 3-1-2 victory in extra time. Right after the game, El Salvador decided to show their diplomatic red card. They cut off all ties with Honduras and claimed that thousands of Salvadorans had to flee from their neighbors' aggressive tackles and fouls. It was like an international version of I'm taking my ball and going home. They accused Honduras of doing nothing to prevent killings, oppression, rape, robbery, and mass expulsion of Salvadorans. The war itself began with Salvadoran planes invading Honduran airspace, and it ended with both countries left in shambles, their infrastructure destroyed like a poorly constructed halftime show. Neighboring countries even jumped in like substitute players, 
promising economic blockades that would leave El Salvador more devastated than a player with a banana peel on the pitch. During the four-day war, El Salvador suffered casualties, Honduras lost soldiers, and thousands were left homeless, probably wondering why they didn't stick to friendly matches over a cold pint at the pub. And here's the hilarious kicker. The football war was the last war to feature Second World War-era planes in active combat. These countries were so broke they couldn't afford new toys, so they bought used planes from pilots who were too chicken to fly them. <sighs> Talk about vintage warfare. <laughs> so, my friends, let's remember the football war as a cautionary tale. When football rivalries go too far, it's time to put down the weapons, lace up the boots, and settle it with a good old-fashioned game of rock-paper-scissors. Or better yet, let's stick to the beautiful game and save the explosions for the post-match fireworks. Who needs war when we can have goals and laughter? Ladies and gentlemen, what an adventure we've had today, diving into all these fascinating stories. We've explored history with a twist of humor. But... Before we wrap things up, I have a little favor to ask. If you've enjoyed this video and found yourself chuckling along the way, it's time to take action. Show your appreciation with a thunderous like. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and join our quirky history club. We promise to bring you more laughs, intriguing tales, and historical nuggets that will make your brain do a victory dance. If you could travel back in time and witness any historical event, which one would you choose and why? Get those creative gears turning. Remember, my time-traveling comrades, history is a tapestry woven with laughter, tragedy, and everything in between. So let's appreciate the past, embrace the present, and keep the quest for knowledge alive. Until our next adventure, stay curious, stay hilarious, and keep exploring the amazing stories that shape our world. Cheers.